In the middle of the afternoon, I got a call from Mike concerning his health factor, and it was not good, and he had contacted Marty, and or tried to, and couldn't, and you know, you keep going down the pecking order to find somebody that might speak. And uh, thus, from the middle of the afternoon to this moment, I'm happy to be with you. And uh, I think the song, Bob, might be appropriate if there are certain times when you might say even more or less of self and more of thee. That would be at an hour when you've got to speak in about an hour and a half and uh, didn't know it. But that's where we are. Now, one of the first thoughts that came in my mind was that our preachers put in the bulletin the title of their lessons. And I thought, what was Mike going to speak on tonight? And I looked in the bulletin, and it said the dividing line. Of course, it's also here on the marquee. And knowing that all of the members of the congregation read the bulletin very dutifully, and that you would certainly know what the speaker was going to discuss this evening, I thought I needed to prepare a lesson on the dividing line. It's not only in the bulletin, but on the marquee. And then I did not hear from Mike at the time he talked to me what dividing line he was talking about. And hence that uh, left another dilemma. What did he intend to say? And a passage or two came to mind, one of which we will be developing in the next few moments. If you have your Bibles, you might want to turn John, the third chapter. We'll just be looking at three verses, but one of those verses seems to identify a dividing line and a rather significant passage in theological circles because it has been territory of great discussion by varied groups. John 3, 34 through 36. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God does not give the Spirit by measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, for the wrath of God abides on him. You see the dividing line, verse 36? The one who believes in the Son has everlasting life. Now he who does not believe, I'm reading from the New King James, he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Dividing line. All on the basis of whether one believes in the Son of God or not. Now there's a fairly prominent religious group that would indicate you're not saved the moment you believe, but that you've got to do a number of other things as they try to work their way to heaven. And what would you say if someone approached you that way? With this passage especially with this translation, isn't it pretty clearly stated that he who believes in the Son has everlasting life? I don't know why, as I visited the Church of Christ, 
that they think you've got to be baptized. And what would you say? How would you from that verse prove that someone who believes in the Son would not be saved? What is everlasting life if it isn't being saved? Pretty clear, isn't it? Now, if that was not sufficient, might go to 1 John 5 and 4, which also clearly states, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. What is the way of overcoming the world? Same thing that Jesus taught. The Bible's consistent. If you believe on the Son, you have everlasting life. That's very clear. People ought to accept God's Word the way it says. And if that wouldn't be enough, you might also turn to Acts 16.31 where Paul and Silas, when they had been imprisoned, beaten that day, Earthquake released the prisoners. The jailer was about to kill himself. And when Paul responded, do yourself no harm, we're all here. No one had tried to escape. Jailer wasn't in jeopardy in that regard. And he fell down before Paul and Silas and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And it says they, I don't know if they said it in unison, but that they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. How are we saved? We are saved when we believe in Jesus as the Son of God. So you see John 3.36 1 John 5 and 4, Acts 16, 31. How many more passages do we need to convince some of you people that when you believe on the Lord Jesus, you will be saved, you will have everlasting life, and you gain the victory? How much more evidence do you need? And what would you say? to someone at that point. All they're using is scripture. And thus, any idea that one must go beyond his faith in Jesus to have everlasting life, to gain the victory, for him and his house to be saved, should be settled in everyone's mind. It's just that some of you people insist you've got to work your way to heaven. Now I hope you're able to discern between satire and maybe some real facts if someone knew the Bible well and covered what I have just covered, what would you say? You can't say it's not using the book because all we're doing is looking at the Word of God. And there's a dividing line. You believe on Jesus? John 3, 36, you have everlasting life. You believe on Jesus? You have the victory that overcomes the world. You believe on Jesus? You shall be saved. You and your house. I'm letting the congregation soak a moment and decide how you'd respond. And it might be best that I respond some now lest I turn all of you into a thought that you might walk across the street and decide you'll take another course from here on out. 
These passages are biblical. They are fairly clear. And they deserve an answer for anyone that would try to give more than faith as a requirement in order to be saved. Two or three ways to maybe answer what was given or what I have just given. I'm looking now in John 3, 34 through 36 as given in another translation, and you may have had another translation when I read this a moment ago from the New King James. John 3.34 down through, just read verse 36. That's the key passage of concern. He that believeth on the Son hath eternal life, but he that obeyeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. What's the difference in the two translations? The difference is one word. In the second place in the New King James where it says, believe, this translation has the one who obeys, which would be something maybe beyond belief. And thus, one answer that might be given is if you had the American standard, it would help you out in that regard by pointing out that the one who believes on Christ does have eternal life, but he that obeyeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God arides, abides on one who doesn't obey. Now, there are a lot of things beyond belief for us to obey. And this would indicate if we don't do the obeying, then the wrath of God could be upon us. So the difference in the translations might be one solution. Of course, if you didn't know Greek and they didn't know Greek and you didn't know what to do beyond that, it might not help you much at that point to have the word obey in one of the translations or in more than one translation. The facts are the translators put obey the second time because you have two different Greek words. The word for belief in the first part of the passage, he that believeth on the Son hath eternal life, is pistuo. And I'll give a definition of that in just a moment. But the other word after that, that in the New King James is translated belief, is another Greek term which is patho. Two different words and a little bit different meanings. For example, patho if you were to look in the lexicon, means to persuade, that is, to induce one by words to believe. If you stopped at that point of the definition, you'd still just be dealing with belief. But it then adds, to persuade unto, that is, move or induce one by persuasion to do something. Persuade them to do something. And it also means to listen to, to obey. And if repentance is in the Bible, did Jesus call on us to repent? If confessing his name before men is in the Bible, did he call on us then to confess him before men? to listen to, to obey, to yield to and comply with. That's the second word. And it implies then that if one does not comply with, yield to, listen to, obey, they've not done that last part. And that may give rise for a number of things for us to yield to, 
to comply, to obey, to listen. So that's one answer, is to observe that there are two different Greek terms that accounts for obey being used in the second part of John 3.36. Now, let's look at the other word, pistuo, which is the victory that overcomes the world. And it's also the passage in Acts 16.31, believe on the Lord Jesus, that's off of pistuo, just a grammatical formation different. What does it mean? Well, it also means to persuade. That is to induce one by words to believe. To persuade unto. Move or induce one by persuasion to do. Wait just a moment. I'm on the wrong. That's the one I just gave. To be persuaded. Place confidence in. To believe one's words. Incidentally, it's interesting to me that in J.H. Thayer's Greek English lexicon, the passage right after that statement to believe one's words is Mark 16, verse 13, down through 15, where go preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But the rest of the definition, used especially of the faith by which a man embraces Jesus, and then it says, that is a conviction full of joyful trust that Jesus is the Messiah, the divinely appointed author of eternal salvation in the kingdom of God, conjoined with obedience to Christ. Now that's pistuo, the word that's in Acts 16.31 and in 1 John 5.4 and in John 3.36. And it means what? One that would look upon Jesus as the divinely appointed author of eternal salvation in the kingdom of God conjoined with obedience to Christ. In simple form, when the scripture uses belief in an approved manner, in every case, that is a faith that will obey. Now whatever the obedience is may be given later, but it's a faith that will obey or it's not true biblical faith. Now the term is used in passages that would indicate a failure to obey. It's a belief that did not so respond, but when it does not respond, it will always be identified in the context as to what was the nature of the people that wouldn't obey. So another answer might be, if faith alone does give to us everlasting life, victory, be saved, how would you explain, and this is a passage you might want to jot down to use sometime, John 12, 42 and 43. Nevertheless, I'm just quoting now or giving John 12, 42 and 43. Nevertheless, even of the rulers, many believed on him. And the context very clearly shows the him is Christ. Believed on Christ. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him or confess it lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they that love the glory that is of men, they love the glory that is of men more than the glory that is of God. Concerned about how they would be treated as to the synagogue, 
and the Pharisees specifically mentioned, they would not confess Christ. I didn't say two or three. It says many that believed on him were in that category who did not confess Christ. And the reason, the motive behind not doing it, it clearly states, was because they love the glory that's of men more than the glory that's of God. Who are you obeying at that point? If you want the glory of men more than you want God's glory, what direction are you heading? I love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world, for all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the vain glory of life is not of the Father, but it's of the world. And he that is involved with the love of the world, Jesus, or John said, it's going to fade away. But the one who does the will of God abideth forever. First John 2 15 through 17. Hence, what about these many that believed but they wouldn't confess? Even states that they loved the glory of men more than the glory of God. Or another passage you might want to use is James 2, 19, where James is discussing a pattern on the part of some. You who would try to be justified by faith without works, I will show you my faith by my works. Added in that context, James 2 and verse 19, that the devils or demons, diabolos, it's the idea of devils is appropriate. The devils or the demons believed and shuddered. But there's no indication those demons ever obeyed. They believed and shuddered. Maybe some like, somewhat like the case of Festus who was terrified. But he said, let me have a convenient season and then I'll obey. Here the demons believed and shuddered. But it does not state they ever obeyed. So you see, there are times when belief is used, but in any case where obedience should follow, it will specify and indicate that they didn't. Now, the nearest thing here in this passage is the word shudder. I don't know if you've looked that up lately, but it's friso is the Greek term for shudder. And you know what the first part of that definition is? That these demons shuddered, did not believe, and shudder. It means to bristle, to stiffen, to stand up. And then it also is given to shudder. And it means to be struck with extreme fear, to be horrified. But the first part and the really root idea of the word shudder is to bristle, stiffen, stand up. The nearest thing I know to it is a wild or a mean dog and you come in the yard and it's ready to devour you and the hair comes up on the back. That's bristling. Now is that dog ready to go along with you or get rid of you? And that's the shudder. So it's not talking about someone that's going to believe and then obey. It's talking about someone who believes, but <laughs> they bristle. They stand up. They're ready to fight, argue, debate, whatever, rather than do what you are wanting them to do. So these passages might come in handy if you were dealing with someone who was trying to find belief alone sufficient. 
The passage, of course, we usually quote is James 2.24. You see that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Now that fits the definition, both definitions of pistuo and patho. It is believing that will obey. It is believing that is persuaded to the point of doing something. Not to believe and then because of the Pharisees or someone else refusing to confess Christ, refusing to obey, listen to grandma or uncle or cousin or some other preacher and not obey and bristle up at the thought of someone insisting that obedience needs to be done. One other thing might need to be dropped into this. I think you would know this material already, but passages like Mark 16, 15, and 16, which is to be preached to how many? Every creature. And he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Or in Acts 2.38, when those who were guilt-ridden, obviously, having been accused of crucifying the Christ or being involved in his crucifixion. And they asked, what shall we do? Realizing they had crucified the Messiah and heard Peter say in Acts 2.38, Repent ye and be baptized, every one of you. How many? Every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. We're saved from our sins. When faith is like this term, pistuo means to obey, will then repent of wrong you've done and then be buried in the waters of baptism for the remission of sins. The purpose of baptism for sins to be forgiven. Acts 22:16, case of Saul or Paul. Ananias said to him, when he had been battling against the church so harshly, persecuting and even casting his vote for the death of people, arise, be baptized, and wash away your sins. Still in sin, and it was at that moment. You see, faith is, if you could put it on a long line, the guiding factor. And if you believe, as given in Scripture, you can have eternal life because of the Son of God that was being discussed in John 3. But the question is, the big question, when in the process of believing is one forgiven? And passages like we've just looked at identify when one is forgiven. You are forgiven when faith leads you to be baptized so you can be saved. Mark 16, 15, 16. Or when you, in your faith, want to do God's will now, not man's will, you would repent of your sins and be baptized for the remission of your sins. That's when God selected to wash away the sins or forgive one of sins. And that's why other passages like Matthew 28, 18, 19, 20 would teach that we are then at the time of the baptism, having made disciples, which is a term really that means students, learners. When you have learned Baptize the learned people into the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. When you become a baptized believer, you have God as a Father, Jesus as a Savior, the Holy Spirit as a Comforter. And that's why Paul would write in Galatians 3, 26 and 27, that we become sons or children of God through faith, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ did put on Christ. We gain a relationship and are into Christ 
by God's selection, when faith has led us then to be baptized. I hope some of this might have clarified John 3, 36. And if someone should place it before you sometime, what passage would it be good to maybe look at? Well, if you want to be, I guess, a little reactionary, ask them about John 12, 42 and 43, where many believed on him, but they wouldn't confess him. Is that person going to be saved? The person who loves the glory of men more than the glory of God? Are the demons believed and shudder, bristle, have their hair standing on end in a reaction with shining teeth? I'm still using the dog assembly here right now, or parallel. That, uh, those passages would work. Remember the definition. What kind of belief is Bible belief? when it is conjoined with obedience to Christ. Isn't that clear? And it would not only incidentally just relate to baptism. We've already mentioned repentance or confessing our faith before men, Matthew 10, 32. But then maybe the thought in Revelation 2 and 10, be thou faithful unto death and I'll give you the crown of life. How long will we need to be faithful all our life? What kind of faith? It's that continuing faith that is conjoined with obedience. Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. Command, and I'll obey. That's obedient faith. Or maybe Paul, Saul of Tarsus, Paul, 2 Corinthians 4, 7, I fought a good fight. I finished the course. I have kept the faith. That particular expression, I have kept, what do you do when you believe and keep the faith? First of all, that is a perfect verb, which means you complete. It's finished out action. It's that kind of faith. It finishes out, be thou faithful how long to death. That's inherent in the grammatical construction when Paul said, I have kept the faith. But the word I have kept, what does that mean? That particular term, tereo, means to attend to carefully. That's what Paul had done. In regard to the statements of the Lord about obeying Him, attend to it carefully. Take care of or stand firm in anything. That's how you keep it. Stand firm in it. So if we just keep looking, the deeper you go, the clearer it gets that biblical faith will obey. I don't know what your resolve is tonight. If you sing this song with a spirit and the understanding and you believe Christ is the Son of God but you've not been baptized into Christ, you're kind of being hypocritical, honestly, because if you're really resolved with biblical faith, you'll do what he said. And you're one of the creatures that has not yet been baptized into Christ. You need to obey as it's given. And brethren, for all the rest of us, in regard to the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, kindness, long-suffering, Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, self-control. There's a good challenge for us this week. Bear the fruit that the Spirit would direct as we obey the will. If you've not been obedient on the basis of your faith, why don't you resolve like the song says? 
And if we can help you by your coming forward this night and either confessing sin as a failure to do what you should as a child of God or if you need to be baptized into Christ, the water is even warm. The angels in heaven waiting to rejoice. And the word is calling you to come. Will you come as you stand and as we sing?